Well, welcome back. We're going to continue our lessons on nuclear chemistry and radiation. This is not exactly the last lesson, but it's almost the last lesson. In previous lessons, we've talked about the basic phenomena of radiation and nuclear reactions. We've talked about types of radiations, alpha, beta, and gamma. We've talked about the stability of nuclides, and so that we can get some idea of why they are unstable. We talked about the concepts of half-life for spontaneous nuclear decay reactions. And then we talked about fission reactions and fusion reactions, and also about the energy that is released in nuclear reactions. In this lesson, we want to talk about a number of applications of nuclear reactions. Now, we're not going to talk about bombs. I'm sorry. We're just not going to go there. Uh, we've talked a little bit about nuclear power, applications of nuclear power to generate electricity, and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, those applications in this lesson. We'll talk about nuclear medicine. We'll see that there are a number of applications involving the use of radioisotopes. If you think about it, a nuclear isotope is a, is a little emitter, a little flashlight. It will emit an alpha particle or a, a beta particle, which is a, an electron, or a gamma ray, which is a, a, a high energy photon, or a positron, which is a positive electron. That is, that they are little emitters or little flashlights, so that if we inject these into our bodies and, and if the molecules somehow can be targeted to different tissues in our body, they can act like little flashlights inside of our body, which will help us visualize what's going on inside. Uh, an example of that is what we call PET scans, and we'll give an example of that in a, in a slide. Also, we'll talk about how radiation can damage cells and biomolecules, and that is the basis for radiation treatment, where we use radiation to kill cells. Now, this is typically this involves a, a cobalt-60 radiation source and a, and a direction of gamma radiation on a particular tissue, such as cancer tissue, to try to kill all of the cancer tissue. Radiation also has agricultural applications, and in, including the sterilization of produce. In one of our first slides, we showed a photograph of the sterilization of strawberries so that they, so that they will not grow mold. And it is a common practice in the food industry to sterilize certain produce, certain fruits and vegetables, in this way to prevent or to minimize mold growth. There are industrial applications. Uh, just as radioisotopes can act as tracers in biomedicine by injecting them into our bodies and looking where they go around in our body, similarly in industrial applications we can use nuclear tracer molecules to look for like leaks and pipes. Also, radiation can be used to make very precise measurements of such things as the thickness of, of films or paper or of the wearing out of gears and machinery. Radiation is used quite a bit in research laboratories by adding radioactive nuclides onto molecules and, and then using these as tracers to study a sequence of reactions, possibly the metabolism in living cells. This might be used, for example, to study the growth patterns in various plants and animals. And finally, radiometric dating is an important application to determine the age of rocks and geological formations and, and also various man-made materials. And we'll have uh, a separate lesson on radiometric dating. But let's talk about a few of these in particular, and let's begin with nuclear power. Now, this is a basic design of a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plants will use either uranium-235 or plutonium-239 as a fuel source, and that is indicated by what are called fuel rods over to the left. And if you remember our concepts that we have to have a critical mass of the fissionable nuclides, and if we have that critical mass, a chain reaction will occur, it's, and it will release energy as an exothermic process, which can be used then to heat water, and we'll see the rest of it in a second. But we have to be careful in nuclear power plants to control the rate of these chain reactions, and that is done by a series of what are called control rods, which are usually made of boron. But the control rods will absorb the neutrons that are released in the chain reaction, 
so as to control the rate of the chain reaction so that it doesn't get out of hand, so that it's, so that it's not explosive, so that you can control it to a, a manageable uh, rate of, of heat production. So when a controlled nuclear fission occurs, heat is released. That heat then heats up or increases the temperature of water or some fluid, but water that is contained under pressure in a circulating loop. That hot water then transfers thermal energy to another container of water to produce steam. That steam then turns a steam turbine. This is going back to now the James Watt steam engine model, turning the turbine, which then generates electricity. So that is basically the design of a nuclear power plant, and it shares a lot in common with a coal-fired power plant where you produce steam and turn a turbine. But in this case, the heat is generated by the nuclear fission chain reaction. Now, some of the pros of nuclear power plants would be that they are uh, energy efficient. Uh, we said in one of the last lessons that it takes about, it would take about 50,000 times less by mass uranium-235 to generate electricity for a city as compared to oil or coal. That is because a nuclear reaction is much more exothermic. It releases much more energy per mass of the fuel as compared to combustion reactions of hydrocarbons. Also, there are no emitted gases of carbon dioxide or nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dye or trioxide, which either lead to global warming and the greenhouse effect, or the nitrogen dioxide and sulfur oxides lead to the production of acid rain. So those are some of the pros of nuclear power. Some of the cons are the issue of waste disposal. And that is becoming a, a serious issue. And, and in fact, uh, up until about 2010, in the United States, we stored spent fuel rods in the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository, and then we stopped doing that because of uh, various environmental concerns, and, and we have not come up with an, an alternate plan in the United States. And so a lot of these spent fuel rods are just sort of remaining at the site where, they're, where they have been produced. Not a good plan. And in addition to deciding where are we going to store these spent fuel rods, which, which contain radioactive waste themselves, there's also concern about transporting them to wherever they would be stored. Also, there is a concern about core meltdowns, uh, either due to uh, the reaction going out of control or something like earthquakes or tsunamis or perhaps terrorists causing damage to these nuclear reactions. There are cases that you've probably heard about, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl in, in Russia, and the uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan where there have been uh, accidents going from minor to serious as a result of uh, some damage to the nuclear power plants. The nuclear power plants that are in use today are based on the nuclear fission model. And as we said, in the United States we generate 15 to 20 percent of our electricity with nuclear power. In some other countries such as France they generate as much as 80 percent of their electricity by nuclear power. But the goal is to develop additional types of nuclear reactions, including nuclear fusion. And nuclear fusion, if you recall from the last lesson, is when smaller nuclides combine together to form bigger nuclides. And this is actually the kind of nuclear reaction that occurs on the sun. The tokamak fusion reactor is the prototype of a nuclear fusion power generating device that is being developed in a number of countries. If you remember the issue, nuclear fusion reactions require extremely high temperatures, temperatures approximately equal to that in the sun, in order for the reactions to go, something like 10 to the 8th degrees centigrade. And we simply do not have containers that can withstand that heat. So, so the idea is to contain a nuclear reaction in a magnetic field. But the problem is that to date, the energy produced by such a fusion reactor is not high enough, is not higher than the energy needed to produce the high temperatures to begin with. And not only the high temperatures, but the magnetic field, the energy needed to produce the magnetic field. So they haven't really reached the break-even point. 
Now, if this could be developed, the pros are that it would be a very clean type of energy source. Unlike burning fossil fuel, which produces the polluting gases, carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, etc., or nuclear fission, which results in these contaminated spent fuel rods, for a nuclear fusion power plant, there would be no contaminants because you would essentially be producing water as the product. Also, the source material needed, the fuel needed, is cheap. Essentially, we would use water from the ocean to produce the deuterium, which is needed as the fuel for these uh, type of reactors. But the cons, the cons are obviously serious. The technology is not yet available. It's projected that it might be available by the year 2050. Now, I've been teaching for a long time, and I can tell you that this projected date has, has been creeping. I remember when it was 2010, then, 10, then 2025, and now 2050. And also, the research is very, very expensive. Very expensive, and with these prospects, you can imagine that, that governments have to invest the money, and there's a reluctance of governments to, to do that in these days. One of these research projects that is the biggest one at the present time is called ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And this is, uh, this is in France. It's the European Union's project. Okay, we're going to pause. Um, I'm going to break up this lesson on applications of nuclear science into, into two parts so that it doesn't go on too long. And when we return, we'll talk about applications in the area of, of biomedicine, biological systems. Okay, see you in a little while.